In the Middle Ages, if you weren't a saint, don't worry, you can still get into heaven. It just might take a little while. That's ahead this week on Footnoting History. Hello, 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 and welcome to Footnoting History. My name is Nathan. Uh, if you're anything like me, you're a fan of the TV show The Good Place. Now, if you're not familiar, the basic premise of the show is this. A young woman named Eleanor Shellstrop, played by the wonderful Kristen Bell, finds that she has died, and her soul has gone to the titular good place. Essentially, this is the way, at least in the show, that the afterlife works. Uh, every action that you take on Earth in life has a point total assigned to it, based on the relative good or bad that that action generates in the world. Each person, over the course of their life, gains and loses points, and when you die, if you have a high enough point total, you get to go to the good place, a friendly, idyllic village or neighborhood populated by fellow virtuous humans, where your every desire can be met, though because you're in the good place, theoretically, you only want good things. Only the top people, though, get into the good place. Simply having a positive balance on your life total is not enough to guarantee entry. You need to be in, like, the top quintile, I guess, in order to get in. Uh, the show is actually a little vague on the threshold number. Uh, if, however, you don't have a high enough point total or you're in the negative, you get sent to the bad place, where you're creatively tortured by what are essentially demons for all of eternity. Now, the catch in all of this and the premise of the show is that Eleanor very quickly realizes that there has been a clerical error. She is not the virtuous human rights lawyer, also named Eleanor Shellstrop, that everyone thinks she is. No, this Eleanor is a bit of a scumbag. Hijinks ensue as Eleanor attempts to keep everyone in the good place from finding out that she doesn't belong there by pretending to be a virtuous person. For much of the first season, Eleanor repeatedly bemoans the fact that the binary division of the afterlife is too cut and dried. Why isn't there a medium place for medium people like her? It is arguable whether or not Eleanor is actually a medium person, but we'll, we'll leave that aside for the moment. Well, it turns out that there is a medium place in this world, uh, but it is inhabited by only one person, a woman named Mindy Sinclair. Mindy wasn't really a good person in life, but right before she died, she did one really, really great thing that garnered her a whole lot of points in the system. After her sudden, unexpected demise, uh, the good and bad places fought over her, and in compromise, created the medium place. When we eventually see the medium place in the show, it's basically like a dry, scrubby Southern California. Color me surprised. Uh, everything is painted in beige and mauve, and Mindy's existence isn't terrible, but it's not great. She has, for instance, an endless supply of her favorite beer, but it's always room temperature and it's never cold. That sort of thing. Now, it would be really easy to look at this afterlife and compare it to the Christian, especially Catholic, vision of the afterlife and say, Okay, so the good place is clearly heaven, the bad place is hell, so the medium place must be purgatory. But there you would be wrong. You see, while there are some similarities, the medium place is Mindy St. Clair's final destination. It is where she will spend eternity. But the Christian purgatory is not eternal. No one spends eternity in purgatory. Which brings us to what I actually want to talk about today. Where did the doctrine of purgatory come from? Well, to start answering that question, we need to actually go back to the origins of Christianity, which is to say, Judaism. Uh, you could also conceivably start with the Greeks, since a lot of early Christian theology was influenced by Platonism, and in Greek philosophy you have a lot of discussion of the purification of the soul, particularly in Plato, uh, and metempsychosis, or reincarnation, but we're actually going to start with Judaism. The ancient Jewish depiction of the afterlife is, well, a little hazy, and it's not the binary heaven-hell that will come to characterize Christianity. The Hebrew scriptures are actually a little vague about what happens after you die. Uh, most depictions in the afterlife are heavily metaphorical or literary. Broadly speaking, though, by the time of Jesus, the general bent, if we can call it that, uh, was that after death, all human souls went to Sheol, the underworld, 
which is variously described as the pit, the grave, and a place of darkness. Souls weren't, for the most part, there to be tortured, but it wasn't pleasant. Increasingly, however, Second Temple Judaism came to recognize that there were gradations or regions of Sheol, and views of what these were like uh, changed over time, especially during the centuries immediately before and after the time of Christ. The deepest part of Sheol was increasingly identified in rabbinic literature with a sort of bad place outside of Jerusalem uh, called the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna, and it was a place of torment for the wicked, though in some literature this torment is temporary and not permanent. Virtuous souls, based on a parable that Jesus tells that I'll talk about more here in a moment, uh, might find themselves in a place of rest or refreshment, uh, not heavenly paradise, but better than the rest of Sheol. Uh, other texts equate this place with the Garden of Eden, where the righteous went to their eternal reward, but not everyone went to either of those places, and many souls were just sort of hanging out in Sheol. But all of these locations were temporary, and everyone was just sort of waiting for the resurrection of the dead on the Day of Judgment at the end of the world. Maybe. Again, there's actually a range of thought and no universal dogmatic consensus. There was even a sect of Jews, the Sadducees, that reportedly didn't believe in the afterlife or that there would be a resurrection. The other major pre-Christian development of the afterlife comes from the Apocrypha, books whose authority as scripture is considered spurious by Jews, but which some Christian denominations accept while others reject. The Book of Enoch, for instance, which was likely composed between the 3rd and 1st centuries BCE, recounts the journey of Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, through the afterlife. Here he learns that the souls of the dead are divided into four categories, the martyred, the just, those who are punished on earth, and those who are not punished on earth. Each of these groups is kept in a separate pit in darkness, uh, in a mountain in Sheol, awaiting the last judgment. Another influential passage is in the second book of Maccabees, which dates to the second century BCE and recounts the Maccabean revolt against the Hellenistic Seleucid Empire. In it, Judas Maccabeus, the leader of the rebellion, prays for a group of soldiers who had died and, quote, exhorted the people to keep themselves from sin, for so as much as they saw before their eyes the things that came to pass for sins of those that were slain, for the soldiers. And making a gathering, he sent two thousand drachmas of silver to Jerusalem to be offered for the sins of the dead, thinking well and religiously concerning the resurrection. For if he had not hoped that they were slain should rise again, it would have seemed superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. And because he considered that they who had fallen asleep with godliness had grace laid up for them, it is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from sins." Many medieval authors point to this passage in particular because it demonstrates, in an explicit way that happens almost nowhere else in the Bible, that prayers and offerings for the dead are efficacious, and by their intercession, the living can improve the afterlife circumstances of the dead. Which brings us to Jesus himself. Now, given that Jesus was a Jew, a fact that I think a lot of people tend to forget, it perhaps is not surprising that he said relatively little about the nature and structure of the afterlife. There are, however, two passages from the Gospels and one from a uh, letter of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians that I want to quote in full here because these are the three texts that form much of the basis of what becomes the later theology of purgation and purgatory. The first of these comes from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12. Here, Jesus is in the midst of healing a possessed man, and he makes the following statement. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. It's this last bit which is the key or in the age to come. Uh, some translations say the world to come. Now, while Jesus is talking here about the unpardonable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which itself has inspired a great deal of theological thought as people try to figure out what exactly blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is, the important thing for the development of purgatory is the implication that some sins might be forgiven after death, that there are things which might not be forgiven in this life, but can be forgiven in the life to come. 
The second passage from the Gospels that I want to talk about is actually a parable from Luke 16, the story of the rich man and poor Lazarus, not to be confused with Lazarus of Bethany, who is the brother of Mary and Martha. Because this is so formative for what comes later, I'll repeat the parable in full here. Now, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died, and he was buried. In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And the rich man said, Then I beg you, father, that you send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let him hear them. But the man said, No, father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. So this story gives us several things. First, the fact that the rich man has clearly not gone to the normal part of Sheol and is in the fires of torment or Gehenna. Geographically, the rich man and Abraham, the father of the Hebrews, can see one another even though they are in different parts of the afterlife, with a gap between them preventing crossing. The final passage that I want to talk about comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, Greece. In chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, Paul chastises the Corinthian followers of Christ for having descended into factionalism, with some favoring his teachings while others follow a man named Apollos. Paul writes, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be spared, yet so as through fire." Now, here we get a few more pieces of the puzzle, perhaps the most important pieces, namely the idea of the purgative or revelatory fire of God's judgment, which will burn away the deeds of this life. In all cases, the follower of Christ is saved, but what differs is the amount of clearing away that is done by the testing of God. The history of early Christianity is, in my opinion, uh, one of the most fascinating things to study, because it is far less monolithic in terms of theology and doctrine than you might think, especially after Christianity begins to actively distance itself at the end of the first century from its origins as a Jewish sect. In fact, it's almost more correct to speak not of early Christianity, but early Christianities, as there was an enormous amount of disagreement on a wide range of issues of theology and praxis. This is, in fact, always a characteristic of Christianity, but again, we'll leave that aside for another day. For our purposes, the sort of next stage in the development of purgation and the afterlife comes with the early theologians of the church. While a number of them speculate on the afterlife, I'm just going to briefly mention three. Tertullian, Origen, and Augustine. Tertullian, or Quintus Septimus Florens Tertullianus, to use his full name, was a Roman of North African Berber descent from Carthage, in what is modern-day Tunisia, uh, who lived from about 155 to about 240. Tertullian wrote about a lot of things on issues like the doctrine of the Trinity, condemnations of Gnostic heresy, but for our purposes, there are sort of two things which are the most important. First, 
Tertullian argues that the story of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16 indicates that after death, the righteous do not go directly to heaven, but are in a sort of holding place, uh, the Latin term for which is refrigerium interim, or interim refreshment. Uh, he writes, This place, the bosom of Abraham, though not in heaven and yet above hell, offers the souls of the righteous an interim refreshment until the end of all things brings about the general resurrection and the final reward. The other remark he makes is with reference to making offerings and prayers for the dead on the anniversary of their deaths, something that we saw alluded to back in 2 Maccabees. This seems to have been a practice continued in the early church, and there was some consternation regarding the fact that there wasn't any precedent or command for it in the New Testament. It had just sort of become a tradition, one with ostensibly some roots back in Judaism. Tertullian actually defends this practice, and he says that offering oblations for the deceased on the anniversary of their death is just as valid as disavowing the devil before baptism or crossing yourself. Quote, if you look in scripture for a formal law governing these and similar practices, you will find none. It is a tradition that justifies them, custom that confirms them, and faith that observes them." End quote. This practice for saying prayers for the dead is borne out by one of Tertullian's contemporaries, the martyr Perpetua. Perpetua was a Roman woman and Christian who was arrested during a regional persecution of Christians happening in Carthage in the first few years of the third century. While in prison, Perpetua allegedly authored a kind of autobiography of sorts, an early hagiography, where she describes her prison experience and particularly visions she had. Uh, she has one where there's a barbed ladder leading up to heaven. At one point, she's transformed into a male gladiator and fights an Egyptian that represents Satan. Uh, it's real fun. In one of her visions, however, she sees her brother Denocrates, who died at the age of seven from cancer. She writes, I saw Denocrates coming out of a dark hole, where there were many others with him, very hot and thirsty, pale and dirty. On his face was the wound he had when he died. Thus it was for him that I made my prayer. There was a great abyss between us, neither could approach the other. Where Denocrates stood, there was a pool full of water, and its rim was higher than the child's height, so that Denocrates could not drink because of the height of the rim. Then I woke up, realizing that my brother was suffering. But I was confident that I could help him in his trouble, and I prayed for him every day until we were transferred to the military prison, for we were supposed to fight with the beasts at the military games to be held on the occasion of the Emperor Geta's birthday. And I prayed for my brother day and night with tears and sighs that this favor might be granted to me. On the day we were kept in chains, I had this vision shown to me. I saw the same spot that I had seen before, but there was Dinocrates, all clean, well-dressed, and refreshed. I saw the scar where the wound had been, and the pool that I had seen before now had its rim lowered to the level of the child's waist. And Denocrates kept drinking water from it, and there above the rim was a golden bowl full of water. And Denocrates drew close, and began to drink from it, and yet the bowl remained full. And when he had drunk enough of the water, he began to play as children do. Then I awoke, and I realized that he had been delivered from his suffering." So Perpetua prays for her dead brother, who it's not clear had been baptized. Uh, this is still pretty early in church history, so if he had died at age seven, and given that the rest of the family were not Christian, it was likely that he had not been baptized. She, by praying for her brother, somehow helps free him from torment. Perpetua's story is pretty popular in the Middle Ages, and it soon became kind of uh, evidence or an example of how the living can aid or help the dead. Which brings us to Origen of Alexandria. A contemporary of Tertullian, Origen is something of a contentious figure in church history, because while he was extremely influential during and immediately after his lifetime, later theologians and ecclesiastical authorities condemned many of his works as heretical or errant. With regards to the afterlife, Origen famously argued, using the passage from 1 Corinthians 3, that Jesus' death on the cross acted as a sacrifice for all of humanity. When Paul says that if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet is so through fire, Origen takes this to mean that all of humanity may eventually be saved. Some people might go to hell when they die, but that might be only temporary. And eventually, after a period of torment, they might, emphasis on the might, achieve salvation. 
Now, this is the first time that this idea is clearly articulated, that a soul can theoretically be purged or purified in the hereafter. Like Tertullian, though, Origen argues that the paradise attained by the righteous after death is also a temporary place where they await the last judgment. There are other contributions by other early fathers, most notably Clement of Alexandria, who's the first theologian to argue that there are different categories or gradations of sin requiring different punishments in this life and the next. But the next major step in the development of the idea of purgatory comes about 150 years after Origen and Tertullian, in the form of Augustine of Hippo, arguably the most influential theologian of late antiquity and the Middle Ages. In his autobiographical Confessions, Augustine talks at length about his mother Monica and how he prays for her after her death, uh, referring what we've already seen in Tertullian and Perpetua. However, Augustine says, prayers for the dead are only effective for certain categories of the dead. In his masterwork, The City of God, Augustine turns his attention to the passage from Matthew on blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and Paul's comment about God's testing fire in Corinthians. He writes, The reason, then, for not offering prayer at the time of judgment for those human beings who are consigned for punishment to the eternal fire is the same as the reason for not praying now for the evil angels. And likewise, there is the same reason for praying at this time for human beings who are infidel and irreligious and yet refusing to pray for them when they are departed. For the prayer of the church itself, or even the prayer of the devout individuals, is heard and answered on behalf of some of the departed, but only on behalf of those who have been reborn in Christ and whose life in the body had not been so evil that they are judged unworthy of such mercy, and yet not so good that they are seen to have no need of it. Likewise, after the resurrection of the dead, there will still be some on whom mercy will be bestowed, after punishment suffered by the souls of the dead, so that they will not be consigned to the eternal fire. For it could not truthfully be said of some people that they will be forgiven neither in this age nor in the age to come, unless there were some who receive forgiveness in the age to come, though not in this age. Nevertheless, this is what has been said by the judge of the living and the dead. Come you that have my father's blessing, take possession of the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And to others, in contrast, out of my sight, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go into eternal punishment, while the righteous will go to eternal life. In view of this, it is excessively presumptuous to assert that there will be eternal punishment for none of those who, so God has said, will go to punishment which will be eternal, and by the persuasion of this presumptuous notion to produce despair, or at least doubt, about the eternity of the future life itself. Here and in other writings, then, what Augustine seems to be distinguishing are several categories of sinners, uh, particularly four, much as we saw back in the book of Enoch. First, the righteous, who go directly to heaven, then sinners, who go to hell, then two intermediary categories, the somewhat wicked, who still go to hell, but whose torment and suffering can be lessened by prayers and intercession, and the somewhat but not really that good, who escape damnation and receive mercy, but only after going through a purification or correction. In a later work, the Incuridian, Augustine draws a distinction between this kind of purgation and the punitive torment of hell. He writes, on our part, we acknowledge that even in this mortal life, there are indeed some purificatory punishments, but penalties inflicted on those whose life is not improved thereby, or is even made worse, are not purificatory. Punishments are a means of purification only to those who are disciplined and corrected by them. All other punishments, whether temporal or eternal, are imposed on every person in accordance with the treatment he is to receive from God's providence. They are imposed either in retribution for sins, whether past sins or sins in which the person is so chastised while still living, or else they serve to exercise and to display the virtues of the good. Not all men who endure temporary pains after death come into those eternal punishments, which are to come after that judgment. Some, in fact, will receive forgiveness in the world to come for what is not forgiven in this one, as I have said above, so that they may not be punished with the eternal chastisement of the world to come. Note, however, that Augustine is talking about this purgation or punishment as an action, not so much as a place. 
It is a temporary period of correction that will be concluded on the Day of Judgment, at which time those people will be admitted into heaven. Over the next 700 years, there will be a few elaborations on what exactly this act of purgation looks like and how the afterlife is structured, but they all build on these foundations which we've just laid. In the late 6th century, for instance, Pope Gregory the Great, in his commentary on the book of Job, will seize on the phrase, the lowest hell, that occurs in that book, to argue for a vertical organization of the afterlife, as well as beginning to articulate a doctrine of greater and lesser sins. In the early 8th century, the English Benedictine monk Bede will build upon Augustine, and he gives an even clearer picture of purgation, writing that there are, quote, some who, because of their good works, are predestined to share the fate of the elect, but who, because of certain evil works, have left the body in an unclean state, are taken after death by the flames of purgatorial fire, and severely punished. Either they are cleansed of the taint of their vices by a long trial in the fire, or, thanks to prayers, alms, fasting, tears, and Eucharistic offerings of their faithful friends, they are delivered from punishment and allowed to enjoy the repose of the blessed. By the early Middle Ages, then, we are well on our way to a doctrine of purgatory, and according to Bede, that time, the amount of time that you're going to spend in purgatory, is quite variable. Unlike earlier authors, where the purgation will last until judgment, Bede seems to imply that one can be free from purgation or punishment before the day of judgment. Again, however, this is not purgatory as a place, but as an action. Where purgatory is, isn't really addressed. Nevertheless, widespread belief in purgation, and that only the most righteous and saintly will immediately enter into paradise, or some form thereof, has some important ramifications. If many Christians are destined to spend time in purgation, what can we do in this life to limit that time? The first and most obvious answer is that of confession and penance. Confessing your sins, which is biblically commanded, and performing acts of contrition and punishment or penance of trying to make right whatever wrong you have done is the first and most effective way. But who knows if I've done penance for all my sins, or if the penance is sufficient? One answer to that question, if you were wealthy, was to endow or patronize a monastery or convent. The most successful example here is that of Cluny in East Central France, founded by William Duke of Aquitaine in the year 910. In its foundation charter, William explicitly sets up Cluny as a kind of liturgy machine for his soul, that of his wife, his family, and then all of Christendom. The monastery was given an enormous and lucrative endowment by William, which enabled it to be financially independent, self-sustaining, and therefore allowed the brothers to spend more time in prayer and saying masses for the benefit of William's soul, ostensibly to intercede to God to save William and or shorten his time in purgation. The Cluniac model, as it comes to be known, uh, is enormously successful. By the 12th century, belief in a period of purgation was a regularized part of the afterlife in Western Christian theology. Numerous theologians and writers discuss this purgatorial fire and speculate on what kind of people or kinds of sins are purged by it, with most authors elaborating in some way on Augustine's theory that the righteous go straight to heaven, the damned to hell, and the less than perfect uh, sort of being put through punishment before entering into heaven. In fact, several passages from Augustine's Incuridion are incorporated into church law or canon law, uh, particularly a section of the work where Augustine says that men's souls are, quote, kept in secret storehouses at rest or in tribulation, end quote, until the day of judgment. And so in the second half of the 12th century, we have a sort of next step in the development of the doctrine. Uh, numerous theologians, writing out of the relatively new university environment, especially the University of Paris, uh, begin to speculate about where this action of purgation is taking place. According to historian Jacques Legoff, whose book The Birth of Purgatory is the foundation of much of this episode, uh, I encourage you to go take a look at it if you want to know more, uh, according to Legoff, what shifts in this period is that theologians start using purgatory as a noun rather than as an adjective or adverb. Whereas previous authors were vague about whether the purging of souls happened in heaven or hell, now purgatorium became the place where purgation happens, and more and more authors start treating it as a third place separate from heaven or hell. In a work on the sacraments and the soul, for instance, Peter the Chanter says, quote, 
we must distinguish between the places for the good and the places for the wicked after this life. The good either go at once to paradise if they have nothing with them to burn, or they go first to purgatory and then to paradise, as in the case of those who bring venial sins along with them. No special receptacle is set aside for the wicked, who, it is said, go immediately to hell." End quote. These are, however, the views of theologians, and not official or dogmatic Christian doctrine. Once enough people begin treating purgatory as a place, though, it's only a matter of time, because people begin to incorporate the vocabulary into their everyday theological workings. Uh, visions and depictions of the afterlife start to include descriptive trips through purgatory. The most famous of these is the work of a 12th century Cistercian monk who says that when St. Patrick was working to convert the Irish people to Christianity, Christ showed him the entrance to a dark hole in the ground and that if someone spent a day and a night in it, they would experience purgation of their sins and have visions of the afterlife. Uh, this hole, which is known as St. Patrick's Purgatory, is eventually identified with Station Island in County Donegal in uh, what is today Ireland, the north part of Ireland. The other development at this point was an increasing interest by theologians in categories of sin. Building on the work of Tertullian, Augustine, Gregory the Great, and others, the scholastic theologians of the 12th and 13th centuries began to divide sins into two discrete categories, mortal and venial. Mortal sins, or serious sins, are ones which damn the soul unless confessed and penance is done. But venial, or lesser sins, while needing penance, are not damning. They do not necessarily condemn you to hell. What was a mortal and what was a venial sin was the subject of some debate, but the acknowledgement of some sins as venial helped to answer the question of what exactly was being purged in purgatory. All of this then culminates in the official adoption of the doctrine of purgatory, which happens in two stages. The first is the definition of purgatory by Pope Innocent IV in 1254. One of the goals of the papacy in the later Middle Ages was the reunion of the Eastern and Western Christian churches, and this necessitated some negotiation over theology. In a letter to one of his papal legates, Innocent IV wrote, since the Greeks themselves, it is said, believe and profess truly and without hesitation that the souls of those who die after receiving penance, but without having had the time to complete it, or who die without mortal sin, but are guilty of venial sins or minor faults, are purged after death and may be helped by the suffrages of the church, we, considering that the Greeks assert that they cannot find in the works of their doctors any certain and proper name to designate the place of this purgation, and that, moreover, according to the traditions and authority of the Holy Fathers, this name is purgatory, we wish that in the future this expression be also accepted by them. Needless to say, this issue is not resolved, and almost 200 years later, at the Council of Florence in 1439, it is still a point of contention between the Greek and Latin churches. It was not, however, until the Second Council of Lyon in 1274 that purgatory became an official doctrine of the church. In its decrees, the council notes that if the penitent dies, quote, before having, by worthy fruits of penance, rendered satisfaction for what they have done by commission or omission, their souls are purged after death by purgatorial or purificatory penalties, and that for the alleviation of these penalties, they are served by the suffrages of the living faithful, to wit the sacrifice of the mass, prayers, alms, and other works of piety that the faithful customarily offer on behalf of others of the faithful according to the institutions of the church. But at this point, really, the Council of Lyon is simply acknowledging what had already been adopted into widespread practice and belief. It wasn't really creating anything new. As purgatory was now officially sanctioned, though, and became the focus of public preaching and teaching, there were now new questions about the line between mortal and venial sins, and what constituted each, especially since preachers emphasized that the least pain of purgatory was greater than the most torturous pain on earth. Even more significant were questions about how effective the masses, prayers, alms, and other works of piety offered by the living on behalf of the dead were. If we have an obligation to say masses for the dearly departed, for our families, how long does it take and how many masses and prayers would have to be said to say, spring grandpa from purgatory? While contemporary theologians may have pointed out that the question starts from the wrong place, treating the afterlife like an equation rather than a change of self, these were the kinds of questions that people had. 
The humanist writer Desiderius Erasmus, at the beginning of the 16th century, laments in his work uh, The Praise of Folly about, quote, those who find great comfort in soothing self-delusions about fictitious pardons for their sins, measuring out the times in purgatory down to the droplets of a water clock, parceling out centuries, years, months, days, hours, as if they were using mathematical tables, end quote. The increased need to do penance also saw the expansion of another practice of the church, that of indulgence, which pre-existed the formalization of purgatory, but was closely related to it. Indulgence is a complicated doctrine, but in the interest of time, the short explanation is that an indulgence is a remission of the penance of a sin, not the guilt of the sin. A lot of people think that an indulgence is forgiveness of a sin, that is wrong. It is remission of having to perform penance for a sin that has been confessed and forgiven. Now, indulgences are usually reserved for highly penitential acts, such as going on crusade or pilgrimage. They're also usually limited in some way. For instance, an indulgence of 40 days given for, say, making pilgrimage to a particular saint's uh, shrine on their feast day, this is a remission of having to perform penance for sins committed in the previous 40 days. Sins, especially mortal ones, still have to be confessed and absolved by a priest, and you may still suffer some temporal punishment if the sin is a secular crime, but you are remitted from having to perform penance. The authority by which clergy dispense indulgences is based on a doctrine called the Treasury of Merit, which is basically a kind of divine faucet of grace. Now, uh, there are many kinds of indulgence, but the best kind is a plenary or full indulgence, which is a remission of all penance for all sins committed in your life up to that point. Plenary indulgences were, until the late Middle Ages, given almost exclusively to crusaders, uh, or in some cases to people who had made contributions to the crusades. Again, though, indulgence is not forgiveness of a sin, nor can you perform a penitential act and obtain an indulgence for a future sin. It is only retroactive. Also, if you're not penitent at the time of performing the penitential act, there are questions as to its efficacy, but like, we'll leave that for another time. Over the course of the later Middle Ages, then, uh, indulgences became highly sought after. In 1300, Pope Boniface VIII revolutionized indulgence by proclaiming the first jubilee year, declaring that whoever came to Rome in that year and visited the basilicas of St. Peter and Paul once a day for 15 days, 30 days if you lived in the city of Rome, that person would receive a plenary indulgence, which again, previously was usually confined just to crusade. While you didn't have to pay for the indulgence itself, this did bring a great deal of money into the Roman economy as people flocked to Rome to receive the remission of penance and time off in purgatory. The doctrine of indulgence really sort of deserves its own treatment, uh, but the most important development for us comes in 1476. Prior to this, the doctrine of indulgence was a deeply contentious one and received condemnation from various quarters for its exploitation, other people defend its merits. In 1476, though, Pope Sixtus IV fundamentally changed the game when he granted an indulgence to the Church of St. Peter in Saint France, which could be applied to souls in purgatory rather than for the living. This application became the basis of Martin Luther's critique of the doctrine of indulgence some 41 years later. Outside of the theological development of the doctrine, with purgatory's formalization, it began to make more and more appearances in literature, both directly and indirectly. Uh, Chaucer's character of the partner, for example, is impossible without the doctrine of indulgence. The most famous literary elaboration of purgatory, though, is of course Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, in which Dante himself is guided by the Roman poet Virgil, first through the inferno of hell, then a climb up the mountain of purgatory, at which point Virgil hands him over to his new guide, named Beatrice, for the third book of the work, which is on the celestial paradise. The Divine Comedy is one of the great works of Italian literature, and Dante was heavily inspired by scholastic writings about purgatory. It's also a very political work, and Dante tends to put people he doesn't like in either purgatory or in uh, the inferno rather than in, uh, in heaven, particularly popes that he doesn't like and thinks are sort of venial popes who have committed mortal sins. 
While Dante isn't really creating a new theology, his work, uh, which does look to Gregory the Great, Augustine, and other authors for its image of purgatory as a mountain, uh, it's also significant in terms of popularizing the idea of a particular depiction of purgatory, uh, giving it, as he does the Inferno or Hell, an order and structure that doesn't really exist in the theology of the time. So why does all of this matter? Well, there are a couple of things that I think the development of purgatory shows us. First of all, there is sometimes a tendency to view religion and religious belief as a static thing, that somehow a religion is a fixed and permanent thing. The evolution of the doctrine of purgatory clearly demonstrates that this is not so. Even if the core or authoritative texts of a faith are fixed, the interpretation of those texts changes and evolves in every generation. Purgatory as a place rather than an action, as a part of the geography of the afterlife, is an idea that takes centuries to be articulated, a full millennium, according to Jacques Le Goff. The second thing that I would point out would be the historical principle of unintended consequence. As a result of the clear articulation and elaboration of purgatory, uh, especially the later scholastic mathematical treatment of penance, where it becomes almost a kind of accounting, there emerged a sort of religious economy of penance. For the rest of the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, the importance of leaving money for clergy to say masses for the benefit of your soul becomes a central part of Latin Christianity. One of the main documents that I study as a historian are wills. And even some of the poorest people in medieval society, uh, your average day laborer, usually make sure to set aside just a little bit of money for at least one or two masses to be said for the benefit of their soul. Even more common is for people to have masses said for the benefit of them and their parents, because one thing purgatory does is to inextricably link the sense of duty or obligation on the part of the living to intercede for the dead. Payment for these masses, or later for indulgences, becomes a major source of revenue for religious institutions. That trajectory is set with the foundation of the Monastery of Cluny at the beginning of the 10th century. Moreover, the doctrine of indulgence, which became explicitly tied to purgatory after its formalization, itself evolved to the point that it was the main focus, as I said, of Luther's earliest critique of his own religion. The 95 Theses explicitly and directly attacks the notion that churchmen are making money off of the dispensation of divine grace, when the greater work, he says, would to be to turn on the metaphorical tap and empty purgatory. So while there may be some similarities, Purgatory has never been the medium place. Uh, that said, the idea of purgatory does have something in common with the TV show's overall premise, that death is not the end of personal growth, and that it is possible to change in the afterlife and to become a better person, one who is worthy of the good place. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>